people. One of our favorites. Um, he is a, a superstar. Yes. And I'm sure he's going to love these compliments. You know, you yeah. just love when people pump you up. Let's, Let's see. keep going. Uh, obviously, the Clippers radio play by play voice. Uh-huh. Part of Big Ten Saturday night. He's on the NFL on Fox. He's on the NFL on Nickelodeon. He is a stud and a half superstar in the building. Let's welcome him in. Noah Eagle. What's yeah. up, Noah? Yeah. Guys, guys, I really, I woke up in a fog this morning. I really wasn't sure I was going to get through a rainy day in Los Angeles. And then you said the Clippers are creeping and so am I. I'm just happy to be here and now I'm ready to run through a wall. So let's do it. Let's get into it. I I feel official now. I'm on the show. This is big. Dude, (sighs) I appreciate you joining us, man. Um, We do want to get into the game. I do have to ask you a couple of questions, though. When did you know you wanted to get into play-by-play? Obviously, your dad is amazing he's a great play-by-play guy too did you know like when you're like three months old that you wanted to do this <laughs> i was actually created in a lab uh, yeah. al michaels was overseeing some weird <laughs> process and they they took some <laughs> dna from my dad plopped it in and combined it with uh spiroditas and so we're a wow. weird amalgam of people <laughs> no i i think that it's funny because most people just expect that i wanted to do this real real young but when i was a kid like six, seven years old, or maybe even older, maybe yesterday, I told people when they asked, I'd look them in the eye and say, I want to be a TV dentist, which I think I invented in my head. Yeah, you know, I, it was, I, I think it was like Dr. Phil combined with like filling a molar or, or putting in a crown, which no. I realized nobody wants to sit at home on a Wednesday afternoon and watch that. Or maybe, you, you know, do. honestly, maybe. I mean, think we have Dr. Pimple Popper, like you could still That's do this. Saying. I mean, you could still do play by play and do this TV dentist. Thing. No, I, please, I like that. please stick to this. Okay. Please. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I, maybe I just had a real, real thing for Chip Skylark from Fairly Odd Parents and his <laughs> shiny teeth. I don't know. But eventually I made the made the switch. I would say I was about 13 or so. And, and from 13 years old and until now, I've been kind of full steam ahead. God, no, I mean, you're just you are so good at what you do. We have enjoyed listening, watching you. What's your favorite part about calling a game? Well, you guys know the feeling is mutual. I always love seeing you guys, especially after a win. Uh, (laughs) There's nothing better in terms of energy, excitement, enthusiasm and everything in between. In terms of calling a game, you know, I think that for all of us, the reason that we get into this is because there's a cap or a limit on what our own abilities on the court or the field or whatever playing surface it might be is. And so for me, knowing that I'd cap out on five, eight on a good day, maybe if I'm really, you know, stretching out and with limited athletic ability, just being there is really the reason that I wanted to continue to be around. And so my favorite part is actually being in the environment and then calling the game itself is challenging myself. I like to see how, how many different, uses of words or verbs or adjectives that I can come up with? How creative can I get? How much uniqueness can I bring to a broadcast that someone who's maybe listening in the car has to say to themselves, did he really just say that? Or as John Stark said in the Reggie Miller 30 for 30, did this dude just did this? That's kind of where I'm trying to get. (laughs) How much feedback does your dad, I mean, I'm sure he gave you a lot early on, but does he like still give you feedback? Will he like, Hey, I was listening what was this or what's your kind of relationship going back and forth? Because I mean, obviously you're doing this at a professional level now. Yeah, Deuce. I mean, it, it's kind of how you would expect. I think it's, it's no different than any other mentor mentee type relationship where early it's a lot of back and forth early. It's a lot of questions on my part of how can I get better at framing this or what should I be doing in my preparation process that maybe I wasn't doing before. And then I think naturally, anybody who does something a lot, and that's really what I always tell anybody who asks how to get good at this, is it's no different than playing the piano or becoming a great free throw shooter. You got to do it. You got to do it a lot. You got to pour a lot of time and blood, sweat, and tears into it. There's no real secret formula outside of that. But I think as time grows, you know, I have less questions and I just kind of go out on my own. And he's real good about understanding that I need to quote unquote, spread my own eagle wings and do it myself in a lot of ways. But at the same time, I know he's always there. And if if he hears something, he's not shy about saying it and being very blunt about it. So I've got some thick skin. So you got the Clippers gig, I believe, when you were 22. Was that overwhelming at first? I mean, obviously, it's exciting. You're, you're working for an NBA team. But 
what was that like process like? Did it feel like a lot at the time? It was definitely different. It was a, a little bit of a, an adjustment because most teams you go to in the NBA, especially now, they're going to have a lot of guys who are 22, maybe even younger. But I was pretty much the young. I think the only player who was younger than me was Avica Zubac, and it was only by a couple months. I think everybody else on the team was pretty veteran status. Even our young guys like Terrence Mann were a couple months older than me. And so I got there, and I, I was expecting like this camaraderie of, of maybe youth, and it wasn't necessarily there. But I was always an old soul, always considered myself an old soul. Like I was the kid going home and watching Family Matters for no reason. <laughs> Or I'll go even like different strokes. I was watching at a pretty wow. young age, you yeah. know, because that's the type of person I was. So call me what you want, TV, dentist, or broadcaster. I knew I'd be able to relate to, to pretty much anybody. Okay. Now I need to know before we get into Kings Clippers, is there anything else that you just, you have a, a hobby or something else that you're doing when you're not watching games, when you're not calling games? Because I feel like a lot of us in this world, when we're passionate about, the sport that we are calling or many sports that we are calling. It's like, we are watching so many broadcasts, listening to so many podcasts. There's not even time for other things, but what, what is it for you that you do? Yeah, no, Morgan, I do think it's important to, to be well-rounded. And so I love TV, music, movies, memes, as you guys know, (laughs) sharing memes, finding other memes, new memes, old memes, memes of all sorts, ultra memeing. Uh, but I do love TV movies of all varieties. I try to to keep up with every show that's happening, which is hard during the season, especially. But I, I do my best to to stay current and definitely music wise. I'm always listening to whatever's new, staying up to date with that. Movies wise, I try to you know we got the Oscars coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'm trying to to check up all the Oscar nominated either movies or performances. Yeah. So I just watched the Elvis movie the other day. Stuff like that. I definitely am I'm all in on that type of stuff. And then hanging out. The normal. I'm a normal guy. At least you're I tell normal. you I'm a normal guy. <laughs> yeah. you actually meet me. Dude, I feel like your dad does a lot of that stuff because he uh, he drops references in his calls too. I'm like, okay. Yeah. He's keeping up here. Yeah. No, he knows. It's not yeah. fake either. No. It's not fake. Although there were there have been times where sometimes he'll he'll have to come to me and ask me, what's the deal with this guy? And then I give him the load down and now he's all in. Now it's like hitting the ground running, but he's had moments where maybe he's been in the car with some analysts. I remember a story he had where he was driving from one game to another with Greg Anthony, where they had like back-to-back games they had to go and they're listening to music. And I think uh, a one direction song came on and my dad started singing along and Greg looked at him like, this isn't going to fly. We're going to have to move on. And so he put on Drake. He goes, all right, I like this. This is fine. So he can he can hang in all sorts yeah. of genres. That's amazing. We get Kings and Clippers tonight. Really excited about this game. I'm curious from your perspective. I know you got a lot going on, but I don't know what your impressions of what the Kings have been able to do this season right now at the number three spot in the West. Deuce, I, I don't know if you remember our conversation from last year before the, the game in Sacramento where I was like, I don't know. I kind of feel like this could be the year. I've always been a huge fan of De'Aaron Fox. I loved Halliburton at the time. And, I mean, I know you guys have probably talked about it a lot. And I know I talked to the guys in Indiana about it. But is that like the most fair trade in NBA history? I mean, yes. it's, it's actually crazy, right? <laughs> As of right now, no, it feels like absolutely, yes, it is. I think sometimes for us in Sacramento, we still look at it and go, okay, down the line, though, if Tyrese Halliburton is, you know, becomes something that's even better than, you know, what he's showing he can be right now, it's just scary when you think about giving up that player. But for what it's getting right now in Sacramento what we need and to stop and end the playoff drought yes it's yeah. feeling very equal and it also what Sabonis has done is he's made De'Aaron better yes just like on and off the court the leadership so yeah it's crazy to think that way usually there's a winner and a loser when it comes to a trade mm-hmm. and you're going wait both these teams look like they're heading in a pretty good Not direction better. yeah no I really liked what I've seen I think Sabonis just continues to be so solid you know exactly what you're going to get out of them pretty much night in and night out with the occasional sprinkle triple double like last night fox i I said going into that draft that that was the dude you know it was always the the lonzo ball the aaron fox conversation i always loved fox i just thought he was a gamer if you watched him at kentucky you knew he was going to come night in and night out he was just going to continue to to do everything he could and every ounce and shred of his being to to find a way to get a win 
I love Kevin Herter. And I will say the X factor to me, and finally people are starting to see it, but I think he has a personal vendetta against me. And maybe this is just my ego getting away, but, but Terrence Davis has to hate Noah Eagle. I mean, it's happening now time and time again where his coming out party in college was against Syracuse in the NIT, Ooh. and that was my sophomore year at Syracuse. And that team came into that season ranked, I think, top 15, coming off a Final Four appearance, and they had a disappointing year, but they were the top team in the NIT. They should have rolled through that tournament. And Terrence Davis came into the Carrier Dome and just lit them on fire. He had wow. 30 points in the game. He hadn't had a scoring outburst like that at all at Ole Miss before that. And then sure enough, every time he plays the Clippers, I feel like he's trying to absolutely end their <laughs> franchise. I don't know what he has against Noah Eagle, but if you guys could ask him, like, hey, yeah. you know, our friend, our buddy, he's got some issues. Maybe just go easy on him every once in a while. So I'm, I'm a little worried that he's going to go for like a 45 piece tonight. But other than that, It'll be a fun game. By the way, you say you're worried. You're not worried. I, I feel like you know the, the Clipper second half of back to back. The West, the addition of Westbrook, I do think you know he's gotten a lot of crap, obviously with the Lakers run. But I feel like he got too much of it. I feel like in this environment, he feels wanted. I think Ty Lue is such a great coach. I actually think the Westbrook addition can help this team. Well, you mentioned the key to me when the and that's T. Lou. You know, I, I think you guys have seen what Mike Brown can do in terms of giving players confidence. We've seen Teron Lou do it time and time again. Now in his third year with the team, I can go down a, a long list of players that have come in and were down on their luck and then have turned it around in many ways. You know, Terrence Mann was with the team and barely played as a rookie, just didn't have that level of confidence that he needed. And then he came in and scored 39 points game six against Utah because T. Lou kept you know, propping him up or putting him up on a pedestal that he needed to get to. Same with Reggie Jackson, same with Nick Batum, same with Amir Coffey last year, Brandon Boston at times. He just, he has this way about him of, of getting players to buy in and, and more, more impressively, I think, giving them the confidence they need to play to their fullest potential. So if anybody can, can un find the untapped potential or uh, create a different role or whatever it might be. I think it's Teron Lou, but I think that Russ is going to help with a lot of what the Clippers still lack, which is rim, pr rim pressure, uh, pace, getting out in the open floor, creating fast break opportunities. They're one of the slowest teams in the NBA, and they really have been the last three years. So to have somebody that can rip down a rebound and take it coast to coast and find open shooters is going to be a welcome sight. And that's scary. Think about possibly adding that missing piece, having Ty Lu you know, bring him, elevate his game to another level, especially while Kawhi Leonard seems to be playing in a really good rhythm right now. Would you say he looks just healthy and um, back to old Kawhi Leonard? Yeah, he's certainly showing a lot more glimpses of it. In January, he put together one of the best months of basketball that I've seen. He averaged 28 points. He was shooting like 55% from three. It wasn't even just from the floor. I think he was shooting almost 60% from the floor. And he was postering guys. Like to me, that's the clear sign of when Kawhi is feeling like himself is when he's willing and able to attack the rim, but do it with the intention of, oh, I'm going to put this on your head. Yeah. Not the intention of, ah, oh, let me find a way. No, no, no. This one's going directly on your noggin. And we've seen that a couple times, especially against San Antonio at a couple just emphatic, emphatic slams. And so it's still a process for him. If there's anybody who's going to take it day by day and meticulously pick it apart, it's him. But I think he knows that he's gearing himself up for April and beyond. And we're just starting to see the beginning stages of that, which is exciting. So, yeah, he's he's got some moments where you're, you're looking at and you're saying, this dude's still a top five player in the world. And that should be scary for the rest of the league. Yeah, I mean, it just looks like with the moves they made at the deadline, too. I mean, we talk about Westbrook, but adding Plumlee, adding Bones Highland, adding Eric Gordon, their depth is just insane. I just think they've got a really versatile team. That's why I think it's a tough matchup for Sacramento tonight. One, yes, I can have it back to back, but just their ability to switch, their ability to defend at a high level. You, you could. This is why people think that this could be a championship contender. Yeah, there, there's no doubt that the ceiling should be a championship for this team. I will say this about tonight's matchup, though, guys. No Vita Zubats for the Clippers, and we know that Sabonis can certainly do some damage. Mason Plumlee has struggled in foul trouble since he's gotten here in the first two games he's played. Now, he's been stupendous. He has not missed a shot from the floor. 
in those two games. He has not missed a lefty free throw either, which oh, has been my uh, favorite thing to watch now that he's on the Clippers. It was infuriating that he was making all these lefty <laughs> jump shots and free throws before he's on your team. And now he's there and you're like, that's my guy. I like yeah. that. I like the lefty delivery, but uh, they're going to need him to play huge. They don't really have another option at that center spot. Musa Diabate is a rookie on a two-way contract uh, as a second-round pick. So he's he's been solid in spot moments. But if Sabonis has his way, the Clippers could be in trouble. However, if Sabonis is neutralized and they can play more of a, a spread offense, five out, it could be trouble then for the Sacramento defense. Yeah, and that's one, one of my fears, though. You know, obviously the Kings, they rely so much on their offense. And I think about the Clippers, even without Zubats in the middle, you still have guys that aren't going to allow De'Aaron Fox to get to his spots. And that's what has made their offense so special as of late. I mean, him and then obviously Sabonis in the dribble handoff and um, getting to his spot at the high post or wherever he wants to be right in that area. So I, I would say I fear the Clippers defense um, in the way that they can alter this Kings offense. Do you think that's something that is going to be going on tonight? Yes and no. So the Clippers defensively were top five for a lot of the season, top 10 certainly in defensive rating for almost the entire season. They've dipped all the way down to 11. And the reason is their offense has been so good that their defense has fallen a little bit by the wayside. If you look at the last month or so, their offense has been one of the best in the NBA. And certainly in these two games since the trade deadline, they have been the best in the NBA. They've been unstoppable on the offensive end. But defensively, they haven't been as good as they want to be at the point of attack. That's something that Teron Lewis has really talked about a lot and stressed to his players of, you got to keep that man in front. And so there's nobody, I think, more dangerous in terms of speed right now with the basketball than De'Aaron Fox. So it's going to be a good test in his first game game in a Clipper uniform for Russell Westbrook. Can he stay in front of De'Aaron Fox? It's a good test for Eric Gordon, who has proven that he's locked in defensively in his first two games, had two big steals against the Suns, two big steals against the Warriors to basically seal those games before the, the All-Star break. It's going to be a good test for someone like Norman Powell, who through most of his career has been a very good defender, but has struggled at times this year and would be the first to tell you that and the first to tell you that he needs to get better. So I'll be curious, you know, first game back from the All-Star break for these guys after a week plus off. They played more games than anybody in the NBA for the second straight year, guys. I, mm. This, to me, was a crazy stat. Second straight year that the Clippers have played an NBA record 61 games before the All-Star break. Oh. So they only have 21 games left. It's the home stretch, so we'll see if they lock in. I also love that Noah mentioned that the Clippers have dipped to 11th defensively. When he said that, I was like, oh, oh that's uh, so cute, Noah. Noah. Noah, if the Kings were 11th defensively, we might have a parade, parade. down J Street. Oh, okay. like, yeah, let's go. It's 11th. <laughs> if, we get to, if the Kings get to 18th, we're like, all right, let's go. I don't know if they'll slow down De'Aaron. They're in 11th. Okay, <laughs> Noah. Yeah, listen, listen. Here's, here's the thing, though. But the Kings are averaging 119.7 points right. per game. That's, that's by far number one in the league. I don't want to hear about your defensive rating if you're scoring at that clip. Because guess what? That means all your games are incredibly exciting. You don't have any 98, 95 that's final true. scores, all right? You don't have to worry about the sub 100 games. Hey, how much time have you spent around Steve Ballmer? Because I, I just watched him from afar and watching him during a game. That guy's pure entertainment. He's so energetic. Have you spent a lot of time around him? Is he like just, is he that way all the time? He is 100%. So I interviewed with him for the job. And oh my God, you were 22 on interviewing him. With, oh my God. Yes, one on one, me and him, mano y mano in a room, 90 minutes, just back and forth. And it was awesome. I mean, it, it, he is the guy who's the smartest guy in the room, but you would never know it. He's the multi, multi hundred billionaire that if you didn't know who he was, you'd be like, oh, wow, he lives in a nice house. And that's it. Like, it's not even all that crazy. He still drives Ford cars because his dad worked at the Ford plant his entire life. You know, he's loyal. He, he, I don't even know where he gets those button down shirts, but if he got him at Nordstrom Rack, it wouldn't shock me. Like, that's the type of guy he is. <laughs> And I remember my, my favorite part of the interview was towards the end, you know, you always get asked, do you have any questions for me? And I said, well, yeah, well, what are you looking for in a broadcaster? And he goes, someone who's hardcore. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can be yeah. hardcore if you want. That was a hardcore great bomber, dude. You've got a bomber. Are you kidding? 
Got to. You got to. Listen, <laughs> impressions are important. Earlier, I was talking to some some kids and, and telling them this Mike Tyson story about how he's watching Friends. And then I just go, oh, rule off, rule off. And they lost it. They lost their mind. So I'm, I'm having a good impression day. Dude, no, well I, you're, you're amazing. Um, I know the next time you come to Sacramento, I think it's late March, but you play the Warriors the night before. I was already looking because it's like, oh, we got to take Noah out. We, but... We've been wanting to take you out yeah. to dinner for a long time, Noah. Yeah. This is these long days. overdue. The, the real question is, when are you guys taking the show on the road to L.A.? And we can oh. really do it up. Yeah, oh. that's a good point. Maybe maybe for the playoffs. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, I like it. I like it. I feel it's destiny, right? It's destiny that this is happening. We've got the West Coast battle coming up in the playoffs. Come on, guys. Will it? I need it. Yeah, I'm scared Will of that, it. though. I'm scared of that. I um, Noah, thank you so much for the time, man. We'll do this again soon. Appreciate you so much. And obviously, you're amazing. We love you, man. Thanks, Noah. Guys, this was an honor. Thanks for having me. It's the one and only. Noah Eagle. Yeah. Dude, he is so good. No, he's so good. Even his impressions. Even his impressions. Like, everything about him. I like, he probably crushed 